I didn't want to make this video. Sadly, it's not one with a good ending. It even involves the need for the use of a helicopter. This is not going to be a long video, but I decided to put it out for education purposes and also to show people that hunting is not always how you see it on YouTube. It's embarrassing and still to this day, I'm disappointed in myself. I feel like I let Rob and Stanley down as well. But most of all, and in fact the worst, is that I will never ever know what happened to the kudu. So it starts in uh, just before Christmas 2022 and Rob from Benula Hunting Estate rings me and says, hey, how would you like to come to Africa with me? He said, I'm gonna go on a Cape Buffalo hunt. I'd love you to film that for some prom promotion for my company. And in return, I'll you know pay for some animals so you can make some videos for the meat hunters as well. Fast forward to April, that's when we went to South Africa. Um, we arrived late that evening in uh, South Africa at Stanley uh, Petersen Safaris. And um, after dinner and a few drinks and stuff, Rob came to me and he said, Hey, I got a surprise for you. I said, yeah, what is it? He said, how would you like to shoot a kudu? Uh, I don't really remember what I said, but it was probably something along the lines of, yeah. So the plan was set. We had eight days to try and stalk a kudu and a Cape Buffalo. And honestly, this was probably our first mistake. So much pressure on a nearly impossible task within that time frame. In between buffalo hunting, Matt, who you would have seen in the last video, the PH there, and I would go and try and stalk this kudu. Uh, and honestly, it was just bad luck. We would see kudu and we're driving around like, you know, to and from the Cape Buffalo places. But when we went out to hunt, we couldn't get close to any. We didn't even see any shooters. We saw some young bulls and stuff like that. Had we wanted sable though, they were everywhere, which is just Murphy's Law, right? When you are after a species, all you see is a species that you're not after. So I think on the fifth day, Rob got his Cape Buffalo, which left us with three days of hunting. Matt and Stanley suggested that we kind of, well, I like swallow my pride and try and go into a blind rather than stalking it because we would have higher chances considering we only had three full days left. So that's what we did. Uh, the first place we went to was on another property just down the road, but the wind was pretty bad uh, and the group that came in just knew something was up. I don't think there was any shooters in that group, so it wasn't a massive loss and it was pretty cool to see Kudu up close and personal for the first time for me. Matt on about the fourth day had put a trail camera out at another spot on another property. Uh, and he had kudus coming into that water hole pretty regularly, mostly in the evening, but there were a few turning up through the day as well. So we had to go and put a blind out there and brush it in basically. There was no blind, it was just a watering hole in the middle of uh, this bush block basically. And uh, let's just say that was by far the best brushed in blind I've ever seen. And they probably did about 10, 15 minutes. On the first day, uh, we didn't see any kudu, but I did get to shoot my very first ever Impala.
the shot was a little high, uh, but it only went about 40 yards, so I'm super happy with that. The next day, the next day is the, the day. We had been sitting in the blind about 11 hours, again on the last, last day, um, and uh, the light was fading fast. Matt turned to me and said, uh, I think we should call it. I said, well, can you see through the camera still? He said, yeah, a little bit. I said, okay, let's give it like two more minutes. Last day, I just want to make the most of this. And about 20 seconds later, I looked to my left and there is this gigantic kudu bull just standing on the bush line. The plan, uh, if a kudu came in, we had the mesh down in the windows, was that when Matt told me, like once the kudu would come into the water, uh, I would draw back and um, then Matt would lift up the mesh so I could shoot through the mesh. So that's what happened. He told me to draw back and I did. Um, and he opened the mesh, but he opened the mesh in the middle window. I'm sitting in one corner, he's sitting in the other corner and there's three panels on the front of the blind because it's kind of hexagonal shaped, or octagonal, whatever. And he opened the middle one up instead of the one in the corner. But instead of me saying, no, no, like, you know, please open up this one in here. I thought, hey, you know, I'm at full draw. I'll just lean in and see what it feels like. And it actually didn't feel too bad. So I got squared up and pulled through on the shot. Oh, f me. Oh, no. uh, nearly a foot low at 20 yards and the arrow sailed straight through both legs, both front legs. As you can hear, oh, I'm instantly me. shocked. Uh, if you've been shooting long enough, you know when you pull through that it feels like a good shot and the arrow does something weird, it's it's a very uh, offsetting feeling. Watching that arrow drop that low, it's, it still eats me inside. Horrible, horrible feeling. So we go and have a look and there's actually quite a lot of blood. Um, if you guys don't know, like legs bleed a lot, muscle bleeds a lot. Um, so we follow it for a little bit um, and found, find the first place that it stopped for a second. And obviously there's a couple of puddles of blood there. Um, but we decide to back out and not push it any further and come back in the morning. We go back and we watch the footage, but I've only got the small phone screen to look at. And so it's... Uh, you know, we don't have that much detail to go through, you know, like, did we break a leg in it? You know, you go through lots and lots of possibilities, trying to be positive, did it bleed out? Maybe we got lucky and hit both arteries and, and it bleeds out. Um, yeah, I'm sure everyone knows how it is. And you know, the shot just over and over again, what in the world happened? It's all I could think about. So it's 5.30 in the morning, roughly. Just past that, um, we're here to try and find the kudu that was shot last last night through the legs as I'm sure you guys have seen um, Stanley and Matt are over here with the drone uh, you would have just seen it take off 
Hopefully, you're gonna be able to find the kudu on the thermal as long as it's limping a little bit and stuff like that. Um, we took some photos from the video so they can identify it as well. The um, cat that's some an amazing drone, absolutely amazing. So, fingers crossed, basically. So, just a little update we're uh, two out of four batteries done with the drone. Seen a lot of animals, but no, uh, not the right kudu so far. Trackers are still on the track, it seems to be doing circles. The blood has dried up now after it actually dumping quite a lot so yeah um, that's where we're at at the moment all I care about this stage is trying to end the animal suffering as fast as we can so Rob and I made the call to get a helicopter in uh, with the hope that maybe we can find a dead kudu we can see one that looks like it from the horns or we find one with blood on it in the right spot and hopefully we can just shoot it and put it out of its misery like this is how serious I am about wounded animals. You don't always have this option, but in Africa they always have a helicopter uh, pretty readily available. And I just wanted to do everything I could for that animal, basically. They're going out for the last 30 minutes now. They've seen about 15 kudu bulls, but uh, apparently none of the ones, uh, none, of, none of them are the right ones. So, I mean, I feel good knowing we've done everything we can to locate this animal, but after this Maybe they say we're gonna follow the tracks more the tracks are still on the track. I think I heard that I've still found some more blood um, But obviously I'll be listening to the pHs if they say look we're not gonna find this bull Yeah, like I say we've done everything we can now um, and I've got I've Got to work out what went wrong. It's a shame that lessons learned in hunting are often big ones like this you know yeah I don't think I need to say it again but I feel terrible when this is not the ending uh, not the ending I wanted so <sighs> anyway um, sadly they didn't locate the bull um, there was a lot of kudu spotted uh, one that looked kind of like mine, but it was running fine and there was no blood anywhere to be seen on it So they couldn't be a hundred percent sure that it was mine and for that reason, obviously we couldn't shoot it um, And that's where my kudu hunt ends So what exactly went wrong? Well, of course before I start everything the sole responsibility lands on me I'm the one that's shooting the bow, I'm the one that's pulling the trigger, so I'm the one solely at fault. But it's always super important to me that I work out what went wrong with everything that happens so I know how it won't go wrong in the future. Does that make sense? If you do not understand why you missed a shot, there's a very good chance in the future that you'll repeat that mistake. Of course, uh, you know, I had many, many scenarios going through my head, you know, did I bump the bow on the blind? Did uh, the arrow hit the mesh? You know, all sorts of things. Did I just completely mess it up? Well, I believe I've worked out what happened. And there are three factors to it. The most clear thing I can see is that if your eye ends up under the peep, then your shot always goes too low. So that would explain the low shot. But then how does my eye end up that far under the peep. Six weeks later, I'm in Finland with my friend Alex and we're doing some practice shots for the, uh, for the opener of the Roebuck season. And he looks at me and says, hey, your draw length's way too long. And so I made a few calls uh, and yeah, sure enough, it was one and a half inches too long. Uh, so when it was set up for me somewhere, there must have been some miscommunication about which draw length it needed to be at. But it's actually here that I start to feel really stupid because I shot this bow at the ATA show and they both felt good actually. The, the prelude and the uh, veracity were both amazing to shoot. When I got my bow, it wanted to creep forward all the time on the, when it's on the back wall, you know, and I couldn't ever 
uh, fully relax into the shot probably because as soon as I would relax, it would jump forward on me. Um, that and I also never felt quite as stable. But I also hadn't shot a bow for about three months before that. Um, and I thought maybe I was just being weak or out of practice. So I was putting the blame on myself. Even if you look in some of the videos from before that trip, when I was practicing or even here just before the, uh, the hunt, you know, I'm with Stanley here and we're just testing my equipment like I always do before a hunt. I'm still hitting where I need to hit. But if you look at my front arm, look how extended that is. It's completely straight almost. Well, I know that my eye was probably under the peep sight and my draw length was too long. There's one action in all this, which is the third ingredient that ties all everything together. Because everyone knows like you can shoot a bow with a too long draw length as long as everything's square. Like with the Impala, I was square in the chair, straight out the window, no problems at all. But when this Kudu came in, it was completely dark in the blind. And I leant forward and with that extra draw length, I'm pretty sure this is what aided to the fact that my eye went under the peep side. Completely dark, so I couldn't see the string buzzing in my eye. I know it sounds probably a bit silly, but you know, my, I could feel my heart, like everything's racing at this moment. So there's small details you're likely to miss out on. And that's exactly what happened. I should have stopped and said to Matt, hey, I need to open the, the you know, the corner mesh. And there's nothing, it's not Matt's problem at all, okay? He was trying to do me a favor by opening up the window. And I should have been the one that said, hey, no, can you open up the other one? My responsibility, I'm the shooter. So what's the moral of the story? I don't think it's anything new. Check your gear, listen to your head. If something feels wrong, don't ignore that feeling. Like, it's not fair to yourself and it's most definitely not fair to the animal. And this is pretty simple stuff. And I have been bow hunting four years now and I just made these mistakes this year. I think everybody has a tendency, or not everyone, I think I have a tendency to get like too comfortable sometimes and too self-confident and just a, one of these humbling moments. The other thing too is even if you're being guided, it doesn't matter who it is, your dad, a professional guide, friend, it's okay to say, no, I'm not comfortable. That's what I should have done. And I, I just, you know, don't, don't want to make a fuss and I leaned forward and it did feel good. It did. If my eye wasn't under my peep sight, uh, then that shot would have been fine. But it was the position that I put myself in that led to my eye going underneath the peep sight. There's a saying that the kudu chooses you, and this clearly wasn't my kudu. I hope he's still running around fine, and uh, I'm very sorry. <laughs>